Fear no more, Shada. I'm here. Phew, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, once again, I was just doing some last minute checks that uh, technology tried to undo. Uh, but in the end, we win. The machines shall not rain. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Mushiri Nyaga with the Local Development Research Institute. Uh, we are the uh, home of the Africa Open Data Network. Um, today, we are excited to be hosting this webinar with some amazing people doing some really interesting work um, on the gender data for, I mean, the financing for gender data. And this is a, a bit more of a global sense in terms of the work that both organizations do. And I'll let them introduce themselves in just a bit. Um, but uh, the, 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 co the context for today is going to be focusing a whole lot more on Sub-Saharan Africa, so uh, you're very, very welcome. Uh, you're uh, going to see that there's a Slido uh, uh, box to the right of your screen. Uh, please jump on that, type in any questions you might have. Uh, the panelists will be happy to, uh, to respond. Uh, and of course, uh, should we not manage to get to everything, there will be an update on the same page uh, within a day or so after the, the event uh, for you to see everything. This event is being recorded, so it will be available still on our YouTube channel. Uh, happy to have you come back and watch it again, uh, especially if something really entertaining happens. Uh, Jamie, uh, please don't hold back. <laughs> so I'm joined, uh, of course, by the amazing team at the uh, Open Data Network. Um, Lynette, Amina, and Victor, turn on your mics and your camera and say hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Lynette. Thank you so much for joining. We look to we look forward to having a really interactive discussion with you today. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Victor, and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, they, they, they are keeping a lookout for uh, your questions, your feedback on Twitter and uh, on, on, the, on the live event page. So please do go ahead, jump in there and let us know what you think. Uh, so as we get started, uh, let's uh, find out, you know, where are you joining us from? Uh, so on the um, on the box to your right, uh, there's a, a little um, uh, space there where you can tell us a little bit about where you're joining us from, uh, who you are. So please do uh, jump on that. Uh, tell us where you're from. You can see that the question is live. So just just on this uh, on this call like, uh, alone, I think we have um, three continents, maybe. Uh, Jamie, where are you joining us from? Hi, everyone. I'm joining you from London today. Ah, see a truly global citizen today. <laughs> and and Shada, you're joining us from. Um. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Everybody, I'm joining you from Washington, DC. Excellent. And of course, the Indian team is, uh, is in Nairobi. So well, we have three continents covered. Um, so in a while, we'll find out uh, just how much of the planet uh, we have uh, represented on, uh, on this call. So I see we have uh, someone joining us from France. Uh, welcome, delighted to have. Uh, uh, you know, someone from proper Europe, Jamie, it's not, it's, I'm just saying, you know, they from proper Europe are here. Um, and of course, a number of people from Kenya. Um, I see someone from uh, oh, the UK, of course, um, and DC. Uh, two people from the United States. Happy you could join us. I know it's pretty early on the East Coast, so I'm, uh, if, 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 if you're joining us from the from the US West West Coast, uh, I, 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 I would buy you coffee, coffee on us. All right, um, so that's going really well. Um, happy to see that we have uh, 
some good presentation coming in from various places. And, uh, and just, just as part of, um, uh, you know, seeing who's here, I see a very big word cloud right now on, you know, for, for, uh, for you know, people joining from, uh, from Nairobi. So I'm happy to see people from home, yay. And, uh, and a few people who are kind enough to say their names. Hi, Davis. Hi, Sally. Thank you for joining. Uh, excellent. Ah, I have a coffee, please. Um, so I'm assuming you're joining from way on the West Coast then. Uh, the West Coast, the West, the West end of, of Africa, the West Coast doesn't really count as joining really early. Uh, but um, if you are joining from the West Coast of Africa, uh, welcome. Karibu sana. All right. So as a, as we continue to share where we're joining from, um, I'd like us to jump um, straight into this. We we have a very short um, short time to hear from our um, our guests, and of course. Um, uh, get a chance to ask any questions that we might have uh, about the, the reports that these two organizations have recently published. Uh, I've known both of them for really, both organizations for a really long time. Um, Shada more than more than Jamie, Open Data Watch more than uh, publish what you what you, what you fund. Um, and it's always such a pleasure to to be in the same space. Uh, that this time we're not in the same room, but we are in the same space. Uh, so hearing from you on the on the work you're doing I'm, uh, is always such, such an exciting moment for me, and I'm sure uh, it'll be quite enlightening for those who are joining us. Um, so to start us off today um, is uh, is Shaida Baidi from uh, Open Data Watch. Um, I'll ask you to introduce yourself a little bit to our audience. Uh, what what is Open Data Watch? What do you do? Um, and then tell us about your your recent report on general data financing. Uh, Shaida, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Muchiri, and thanks, Lynette and Victor, for, for the invitation and putting this event together. This is a very special week because we have the Generation Equality Forum also underway. And in fact, we also had the, uh, the Health Data Summit uh, yesterday. So it's really a, a week to think about data and data for equity and data for improving uh, people's lives. So. You know, thank you for uh, putting this together. Um, my name is Shada Badi, as Muchiri said, and, and I'm the managing director and co-founder of Open Data Watch. Is a, we are a small NGO in Washington, D.C., but we are spread across the world, too, with staff uh, in other places. And we're basically focusing on improving and helping national statistical offices to improve data availability and quality and do a lot of advocacy for them for financing and for kind of getting data to be valued by by all, by users, but also by you know uh, politicians, by decision makers, by international organizations. So, um, you know, I we work very very hard, and we love our partners like the uh, you know Muchiris group and other groups that we work with. This is really a, a group activity, a family uh, operation. So I have uh, Muchiri has asked me to uh, give you a sort of an overview of a recent work that we have done on gender data financing, which is very close to my heart for years, we've been working on it. I'm gonna share my screen and go through a set of um, slides to just help the presentation. Um, so yeah, what does it take? And um, you know, filling gender data gap. And this is a report that we have done with and for Data2x, many of you who have heard of gender data, you know of Data2x because it's a very powerful uh, NGO also uh, in Washington hosted at the UN Foundation that is advocating and working on the technical issues for gender data uh, gap filling. And they're very busy these days with the Generation Equality Forum. So, we, we have started working on, when we started working on gender, uh, gender data financing, one of the issues that we had, we have been sort of trying to address is what is gender data in within the bigger uh, data ecosystem? And could we 
actually identify that is actually can as you can imagine when you want to cost it when you want to advocate for it you can say well spend everything on all the data data ecosystem so you have to kind of slice it up in some ways of saying these are core and these are important for improving lives of women and girls so we attempted to do that and here in this uh, slide, I'm basically summarizing some of the elements of the uh, core gender data system. The important of the core is that when you, you know, when planners are talking about gender data, they could focus on it. When there's a conversation going on with finance, with financial providers, you can say, okay, I need more funding for, say, improving uh, time use data or improving um, survey systems. So, and also when you're costing it, when you want to find out how much does it cost, it becomes you know, a useful mechanism for discussion. So it's not a scientific method because you cannot really go down to the surveys and say, well, question 48 to 58 is gender. So this is how we're going to be, you know, just we're going to be focusing on those questions. You really to improve gender data, you have to improve the foundational data system of a country. That's given. But this core gender data uh, tools has been very useful for us to discuss. And it's been the foundation for the, serve, uh, for the research that we have done on the costing. So, you know, we're going to be using that a lot. But Knowing the core, of course, then you also have to know what are the gaps that you have. And our, our research has been focusing on the 74 IDA eligible, the International Development Association IDA eligible countries. Those are the countries that get very, you know, um, uh, very low uh, uh, interest rate or grants from uh, World Bank and from the IDA. So, We've been focusing on 74, and as you know, um, uh, 40 of the 74 of Sub-Saharan, of the IDA countries are Sub-Saharan Africa. So our work has been on 74 countries, but we've been, you know, uh, most of the Sub-Saharan Africa is very important part of the IDA. So what are the issues that we have to address? So we've looked at a lot of information on gaps in data. I will not go over everything, but I just highlight a few things for you, because again, conversation about gender data financing has to start by saying what data we need for what do we need it and what are the current gaps. So very important to know about your about countries gaps. So one of the gaps is, of course, you know, our famous gaps on uh, SDG related indicators and indicators which we need to have sex disaggregated data and as we see from a lot of the research that we have done for Sub-Saharan Africa, for Latin America, and for East Asia, we see that we still almost like half of the gender, um, the indi important indicators that we need are missing. And another interesting thing from this research that we see is that we have looked at both national databases and international databases. And one of the good things which is happening and is very different from the previous decade is that national data is improving faster availability than international data. So as you see in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, if you look at the national databases there are 47 you know, person available, but but in the international databases, there are less. When I started my my work in in data business in you know in I wouldn't say when well in late seventies, this was completely a different picture. We only had data from Sub-Saharan Africa in international databases. Very few indicators available at national. So this is a good thing that we see improving, but still we have a long way to go. Another gap that we've looked at is in the availability and openness of data. And the, in here, you will see the, the availability of data for gender data against non-gender data. And as you see in the orange bar, the gender data is less available than non-gender data. So that already tells us that we have a quick win that we could make, that if, you know, if we could make data more available and more open, there would be more gender data in the hands of users. So it's already 
what I'm trying to say is every time you look at your gaps, you look at your weaknesses, I'm always an optimist. That would give you, give you a really good picture of how you can improve and you know, get to where uh, you, know, you can make data in hands of users. The two other ways that we have looked at the data um, um, sort of availability and issues is look at it by, by instruments. And as you saw from the core data, uh, gender data, you need a collection of surveys and administrative systems to be able to um, complete the gender data uh, ecosystem. Here in, in the work that we have done, I wouldn't stay on this slide too much, but it's a very rich slide because it, it, it tells us in terms of surveys, first, what is, what is the standard, international standard that we need to have in this case between 2015 and 2019? You need, for example, four household surveys you know, um, and only two countries um, have that right now. And you also, you also need to have, say, five labor force surveys, and there are only 10 countries, or standard for use, house, um, for, you need to have at least one time use survey in that period of time of four years. And there's only one country that has that. So this, here's another way of looking at how uh, countries can overcome and look at international standard and sort of see where their uh, weaknesses are and how they can bring themselves up to that international standard. So this was for the surveys and for the for ad administrative systems and um, uh, and uh, and civil registration, vital statistics, and administrative system. We also have come up with a in this research a way a methodology to evaluate high, low, and medium capacity and for kind of measuring where countries are. And again, as a guide, if a country has a civil registration system, but still in the weak um, category, meaning that there are not enough registration and you know, death registration or birth registration or marriage or um, you know, divorce and, and the system is still weak as what needs to improve. So keeping an eye on where countries are and watching where against the standard is a very important part of the gender data financing and, and work that we do. The last thing I'm, I'm gonna say on the, on the capacity is that sometimes capacity issues on top of each other. If you have you know, a weak uh, survey system or weak administrative system or weak foundational system on top of each other is really is, is something that needs to, uh, we need to watch for and need to watch for how many countries are falling into that all categories of weakness because that's that means basically you need to build a much stronger foundation. So here you see that we've tried to measure to see how many countries are in different weakness categories and how do they overlap with each other. Here, for example, in the middle of the Venn diagram, you see that 20 um, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have weaknesses in, in all these three categories, meaning weak a survey system, weak administrative system, and weak foundational system. And again, this gives you a lot of information as what needs to be done and what can be uh, what we can improve on. Moving a little bit to the costing side, the, the research that we have done is very um, rich on uh, on sort of what you know, how much does it cost? What is the gap? And you know, how much donors have to pay? How much domestic resources have to pay? What is the shortfall? How do we fill that gap between now and 2030 when we're supposed to deliver on SDGs, you know, and so on. So I really urge you to, um, to read uh, the paper and uh, there's a lot of information there. And my colleagues who are maybe online, maybe they can provide the link uh, in one of the chat boxes or Q&A, a link to the paper uh, if, for those who are interested to read it. But overall, we have tried to um, to cost the um, this gender you know this uh, core data system that we need for how much does it cost between 2015 and 2020 the number is large is 971 million us dollars and but we also try to sort of see what is the 
how much do donors have to pay and how much domestic resources have to pay and then what is the uh, what is the gap that we are talking about and we've looked at a lot of the national plans and we see that countries are beginning to you know have uh, um, finance it from domestic resources but it's still only 48% um, average, on average, 48% of the financing is done by domestic resources, and over 52% of that is done by, sorry, I, I jumped. Uh, can you see my screen? Something happened. Yes, okay, got it. So we do have a financing gap, and uh, there is a uh, we have a financing gap of about 450 a million dollars um, that we need to worry about. And then going forward um, and for looking at the, um, for 2020 to 2030 to 2021 to 2030, where the um, end of the SDG goals are, we estimate that we need 1 billion uh, US dollars needed per year from domestic and external resources. Again, this is for all 74 you know, IDA countries. So it's really a large number because it has a number of countries in it. And then if you, if you go with the assumption that 48% uh, is uh, financed by domestic financing, then the share of the, uh, the gap would be 500 million US dollars that's needed from donors per year until 2030. Now this means, if you look at the flows right now, this means basically you have to double your external funding from donors to get to this. So as we see, it's a very important agenda and it's a tough agenda. So, and that's why today's discussions and our advocacy is really important for countries both to increase their domestic, but also um, external uh, financing. I will not stay on this slide too much, but I just wanted to show you who are the top donors and who are the top recipients of the aid uh, for gender statistics that we are talking about. And our, um, our research covered 2014 to 2018. And as you see that there is not very good distribution of donors and some donors like World Bank put a lot of money into you know, regional funding, but then you know, maybe other donors very specifically fund uh, some instruments. And one of the call to actions for us is to, for donors to come together and have a much better ways of uh, um, collecting and pulling funds together for uh, gender data. And as you see, we also have the top recipient countries uh, here and their share. And some countries are getting much more than of course others, because again, it's, uh, it's very uneven and countries need to do much better in you know, advocating for the gender data financing. So, uh, where does, you know, where are the fundings come from? I think many of you who are on this webinar probably know the different methods, so I don't have to go through it, but we have in the paper, we have what we call a menu of options of how countries can um, um, uh, ad take advantage of different resources, whether they're talking about domestic resources, of course, you know, loans and grants like from the World Bank and, or from African Development Bank, from other multilateral organizations. Lots of, you know, the bilateral grants are really going up for gender data. And right now, gender data is much more financed by bilateral uh, um, organizations than even multilateral organizations. Each one of them have an advantage, you know, uh, bilateral grants are faster, but maybe the reporting requirements to the donor would be much more uh, complicated. And then on the right hand side, you will see technical assistance is one of the means for improving gender data financing. For example, IMF uh, is very famous in, in providing or UN Women, as you've heard, many of you, many of the countries are benefiting from UN Women technical assistance. And then multi-donor uh, and pooled trust funds. And of course, uh, very important new emergency funds that are coming into play. And it's important to not not forget that um, gender data financing could really benefit by making a case for um, drawing from some of these emergency funds. 
my last slide is to you know to uh, some of the recommendations for moving forward and um, because as you said as we said at the beginning of the webinar um, Muchiri, we really need a coalition of stakeholders come together come together for for data but for financing for gender data and financing for gender data it really needs a coalition of stakeholders we're very pleased to see that the burn network which which again is a coalition of donors coming together to improve uh, quality and volume of uh, financing for data has been very good and very much focusing on gender data issues. And in fact, there is a, you know, um, um, sponsored by the Bern Network, Paris 21, who is the secretariat for the Bern Network is developing a clearing house um, for financing, which is, you know, which I'd be happy to tell you more, maybe in the, the question and answer part of this session. But gender data is going to be a channel, it's going to be a very important part of this platform of the clearinghouse. So that's that's really good news. Um, the second important um, um, recommendation that we are following, which I think is, is music to everybody's ear, is that we need to increase use of data. And for as long as data is not used, it's very difficult. We are, we are caught in a, a vicious cycle and use and improving um, and gender data use really could put us in a, what we call the virtual cycle. Um, we need to deliver promises of new alternative gender data sources. And there's lots of promises of uh, new sources. Uh, big data can help gender data. And we need to really come together and see whether we can the benefit from that. Uh, we need to encourage support for countries. You know, domestic, uh, domestic resource mobilization is really a way forward for solving this, um, this problem of gender data financing. So advocacy in countries, better reporting, improved NSDSs, um, webinars like this, of course, is very important. Building a network of gender data um, um, you know, focal points in countries, many, many activities that we can do to encourage support. And, and of, of course, encourage core gender data system. In other words, really in, 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 look, at, look at these issues very holistically and improving modes of support for uh, gender data. Um, and of course, again, I would mention the clearinghouse here as a way of improving the demand and supply for gender data financing. We need to know more about what countries' needs are, where they need, and we also need to know much more of the supply side of the gender data financing. And Clearinghouse is a very promising platform for uh, bringing that uh, supply and demand together. Muchiri, there's, there's a lot to say about this work and this report, and of course, this important topic. But I hope I gave you sort of a flavor of the work that we have done and some of the areas that we are working on for future research. And I'd be happy to answer any question. And again, thanks for the opportunity to present this work to you. Thank you very much, Sheda. Um, as always, you know, we believe that this is the kind of output that will help in our advocacy. Um, as we speak to our colleagues in the public sector, um, support their efforts on domestic resource mobilization. Um, yeah, and then, you know, try and continue to explore ways in which we can help our, our colleagues in the public sector make a really strong case for domestic sources of, of financing for gender data. Because I, I think, you know, you and I know um, the resilience of a country's uh, critical sources of data for decision making uh, can be very reliant on the extent to which it is funded internally. Um, it keeps you from being affected by the ebb and flow of uh, development finance. Uh, that you know, pandemics, for instance, can have an impact on that. Um, and uh, you, you don't want your critical sources of data to be knocked out of out of um, uh, you know uh, to be made un unavailable. Uh, just because uh, your your partners are having to scramble and deal with their own uh, crisis, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's good to see that that remains a big issue. That, you know, that's made some progress, uh, but I'd begin at some point, you know, to really unpack this. I know we're talking about it for agriculture, but you know, trying to figure out how do we unpack this at a sector level as well, because you know there is uneven progress, right? 
um, even in a single country, one sector might be doing really well, mobilizing domestic resources, and another, you know, struggling to make a case and reliant on on donor financing. Yeah. You got it. You you got the paper, Machiri. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Shaida. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some new questions coming in. Um, I know uh, the link to your report has been shared on the Slido. Uh, if you have, uh, if you've not seen it, you can find it on the Open Data Watch website, uh, but it'll also be shared um, in the course of this meeting again. Um, so if uh, for, for all of you online, you can see on the Slido a question about what kind of issues you're, you're working on. So go ahead and, and share that. I can see we have a few people working on, 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 uh, on climate change, uh, who, are, who are in the room today, and of course, um, it, that's a that's a very gendered um, issue. Uh, you know, the climate impact of climate change that vastly affects women and girls more than it affects men, uh, but it does affect everyone. Um, and I can see digital inclusion is is mentioned there, and of course, gender data uh, is one of those areas that has been mentioned. Um, so it's it's good, glad to hear. And as as we listen to the next presentation if you have any questions please do put them in in the chat uh we'll be happy to uh you know pass those along uh to our colleagues uh, from open data watch and publish what you find and on that note jamie um tell us a little bit about uh you know what what your organization does uh, about your report um and how we can go out and change the world so much no pressure, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Michiri, for inviting me to, to speak here. Uh, and thank you to the team, Victor, Lynette, and Amina. Um, I also want to uh, just express that it's such a pleasure and privilege to be here um, at this specific platform, uh, which we really think is doing great work, the African Open Data Network, and also a, a real pleasure to be on the panel alongside Shada, who we really admire and we really uh, enjoy the work of Open Data Watch. And a lot of our findings, uh, which we'll present in, in my presentation, uh, are very much in line with what uh, Shada was talking about. So I'm sure we'll have a very fruitful discussion and see how uh, our work on gender data and also gender financing data is very closely related. So I'll share my screen. Uh, as mentioned, I'm based in London and I work for Publish What You Fund. And I lead our gender financing project. We started this uh, two years ago, a little under two years ago, um, to really seek out, you know, in 2015, when we created these sustainable development goals, a lot of governments have agreed that uh, achieving gender equality is essential, not just as a standalone goal, um, but also it's integral to achieving many other development goals. And with that, they also agreed to increase investments in gender equality. So our work uh, was really focused on how can we track these investments and how can we really see the impact of these uh, investments by donors and governments. So with our gender financing project, uh, we actually have two organizations leading this. We have Publish What You Fund, uh, and we're the global campaign for aid and development transparency. Most of us are based in London, but we also have colleagues in the US, uh, Kenya, and Bangladesh. And we have our sister organization in the US called Friends of Publish What You Fund, and they focus on improving the transparency and effectiveness of US foreign assistance specifically. Now, of course, we don't just work alone. Uh, our gender financing project has three case study countries where we conducted research in Kenya, Nepal, and Guatemala. So we also work quite closely with our country consultants, including Lynette, who uh, is part of the LDRI team, as well as Suecherahal and Gabriela Munoz in Guatemala. And finally, uh, we've received support from Save the Children and Plan International for this project. So just to give a brief overview of how gender data and gender financing data differ uh, and also how they connect, since they are very similar terms, it might be useful to describe what their purpose is and how they help us understand uh, the world and the change we're trying to make. So gender data is really focused on understanding the experiences of men and women uh, based on their location and other identity characteristics. And as Shada already mentioned, there are several sources uh, of data here. We have censuses, surveys, and admin records. And for gender financing data, uh, the purpose of that is really to understand donors and government's efforts 
to improve the experiences of men and women and to achieve SDG 5 or Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is to achieve gender equality. And so it includes uh, financial and programmatic information. So really the funding flows towards gender equality and the scope uh, of, that, um, of that work that's going on. Sources of gender financing data include domestic budgets, um, as well as aid and information management systems or AIMS, uh, as well as donors reporting to the OECD CRS, which stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Creditor Reporting System, a whole mouthful, uh, but essentially their aid and development flows, uh, as well as the International Aid Transparency Initiative or IADI. Uh, and donors own portals as well. So a wide range of sources, just like with gender data. Now, these types of data are different, but they're very much connected. Uh, gender data can inform gender financing. Uh, if we understand the experiences of men and women uh, and other gender identities, that can inform donors and governments, uh, as well as autonomously resourced um, organizations work on how to improve gender equality programs going forward. And gender financing data should ideally include gender data. So when donors and governments have initiatives to improve gender equality, we really want to make sure that these initiatives have gender disaggregated information, have indicators uh, that allow us to understand how these projects are really moving the needle towards uh, gender equality and the impact they're having. So gender disaggregated results data, for instance. So we really need both to hold governments and donors accountable to their gender equality commitments uh, for their SDG commitments, but also the commitments that have been made since then, like with the G7 uh, and the Generation Equality Forum as well. Now, we believe that transparent and accurate gender financing data can have uh, many positive outcomes. We believe we can help improve the coordination of gender equality efforts, the allocation of resources, uh, better alignment of priorities. We also think it can help to uh, fill any funding gaps towards gender work and perhaps prevent the spending on duplicative or less effective projects. Finally, it can help us understand which investments are really effective um, and ultimately to hold funders accountable to their commitments. However, uh, our research in Kenya, Nepal, and Guatemala suggests that tracking gender financing data is still really difficult. And so in our presentation today, we'll cover the findings for Kenya as this is more closely related to uh, the group's interest. Um, but a lot of these findings uh, are resonated in Nepal and Guatemala and therefore are probably very likely present in other uh, Sub-Saharan African countries as well. So with our gender financing report, which we produced um, last year and published in March, uh, we are really trying to assess the availability and the quality of public information on gender work in Kenya. And with this report, we also have very practical key considerations to the government of Kenya and international donors on how they can better meet gender equality stakeholders' uh, data needs. Our findings and our considerations are based on a variety of uh, methods. We have conducted national budget and policy analysis We've done our own international donors funding analysis where we look at multiple global databases and uh, the ePromise system, which is Kenya's AIM system, as well as donors own portals. Uh, and besides the kind of quantitative information, we conducted interviews with key gender equality stakeholders in Kenya to make sure that the data is uh, representing the experience of stakeholders on the ground. And we also conducted a follow-up survey to get a bit more insights uh, as well. So the reason why uh, Kenya would need better gender financing data is because gender equality stakeholders um, in general aren't very satisfied with the amount and the quality of data that is available. The dissatisfaction was highest um, among Kenya-based NGOs, women's rights organizations, so a lot of local and national players but also with international NGOs uh, and research institutes. And the main reasons for their dissatisfaction were that they believed the data on gender work in Kenya wasn't detailed enough, uh, it wasn't gender disaggregated enough, uh, maybe not as timely as they would have liked, 
And in some cases, they found that information on gender equality work and funding was actually um, different depending on the data source you looked at. So that made it difficult to trust the information and to know which information is ultimately accurate. Uh, and without access to quality information about uh, where funding is really going, to which groups uh, and which sectors, it's very difficult for stakeholders who work on gender equality to identify gaps and to plan and implement programs to address gender equality in Kenya in the future. So we also wanted to check what we were able to find with our own desk research. Uh, so when we did our budget analysis for Kenya for the last three years, we looked at how much of their funding was actually indicated to target gender equality. So the Kenyan government, uh, or specifically the National Gender and Equality Commission, has developed a gender responsive budgeting marker, which means uh, that this marker can be applied to different initiatives, different funding, uh, and indicates that it is meant to improve gender equality in some way. However, from our analysis, we could only find that, uh, as you see on the bottom of this table, that uh, less than 1% across the last three years was really uh, targeted towards gender equality. And that is because uh, we actually found that there was a lack of implementation of this gender responsive budgeting marker. So that means that the spending towards gender equality in Kenya could be a lot higher uh, than the budgets maybe um, allow us to believe. We also found that there was a lack of disaggregated information, which makes it hard to say um, how government funds are really supposed to support the gender equality policies for Kenya. And then when we looked at the AIM system in Kenya, which shows international funding um, for Kenya, there wasn't actually a gender responsive budgeting filter, um, which means that you can't really use that system to verify how international funds are spent to support gender equality in Kenya. Um, Femnet, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, um, supported our, our work and um, they offer valuable insight that gender budgeting really is an opportunity to make sure that policies and fiscal policies are aligned um, and that meaningful change towards gender equality can't be reached unless those are um, in line. So some of our key considerations to the Kenyan government to make gender financing more transparent include filling the gender responsive budgeting implementation gap, making sure that at the national level and the county level, uh, the gender responsive budgeting marker is really being used um, so that we can track spending and how it is supporting gender equality policies. To improve the quantity and quality of gender financing data, this is very much tied into the first point, making sure that uh, most of the data has been screened with the marker um, and also making sure that it's disaggregated enough for us to, to track um, how it's moving the needle towards gender equality in Kenya. And finally, um, to identify and meet gender advocates data needs, um, Publishing data, of course, is a very important step, but it is only the first step. Um, we really want to make sure that there's engagement between the data publishers and the data users to make sure that the data that's, that is being put out is actually most useful to inform their gender equality work. So really making sure that there's an engagement there uh, throughout you know, the whole data cycle of initiatives. Now, we also looked at gender financing by international donors. And for this, we looked uh, at the OECD creditor reporting system data uh, for 2018. This was the most recent uh, data at the time of our research. There's a bit of a lack when it comes to CRS data, um, but uh, the benefit of this data is that it is validated, so it is very trustworthy. Um, and when we look at the total funding for Kenya and how much of that is targeted towards gender equality, we actually see that about a fifth of donors funding that was reported to go to Kenya uh, is dedicated to improve gender equality in some way, which is great. However, um, there are different levels of priority for gender equality. So for instance, uh, if funding is marked to be significantly targeted towards gender, that means one of the objectives of the activity is to improve gender equality. Whereas if it is marked to be principal, that means that the main objective of the activity is to improve gender equality. And we see quite a difference in, in those levels of gender funding. We found that only 3% of donors funding for Kenya has gender equality as the main objective. So this suggests that gender funding might be mostly gender mainstreaming, but not have gender equality as the main purpose of an activity. 
If we break the gender financing down, so the significant and the principal gender funding, we have some other uh, trends that show us what donors' priorities are uh, and how they're funding gender equality work. We see that donors' uh, funding for gender really comes in the form mostly of ODA grants and short-term project-based work rather than, say, core funding. Uh, it mainly goes to NGOs based in donor countries rather than, say, NGOs based in Kenya itself. And of the 33 sectors that receive gender equality funding in Kenya, the most uh, popular one is reproductive health. And the most popular subsector or the theme, if you will, um, is STD control, which includes HIV AIDS prevention. And um, less than 2% of donors' gender financing goes to women's rights organizations or gender government institutions like the NGEC or the Gender State Department um, and ending violence against women and girls in Kenya. So we know that these two themes are crucial in making sure that we have transformative and sustainable change in gender equality. But unfortunately, uh, a very small amount of all gender financing actually is targeted towards these objectives. Now we know that this is only part of the picture because there are issues with inconsistent and incomplete reporting. Um, we know that not all donors report to uh, the OECD, for instance, and other databases, which means that we have a few questions still. Firstly, who are really the top gender donors for Kenya? If you look at one database, the picture might be very different from another. So when we look at the OECD CRS, there would be a, a top five, Whereas, for instance, when you look at IATI for gender funding, the top five will look very different. Um, and the main reason for this is inconsistent use of gender markers. Um, but it also is, you know, inherently the structure of these databases are different. So the picture will look very differently depending on when you look and who is reporting to these databases. Secondly, are donors aligned with the Kenyan government's gender priorities? And if so, how can that be reflected in the data? At the moment, just like with the Kenyan budgets, a lot of the data that's reported by donors isn't necessarily gender disaggregated, uh, nor does it have a lot of results information. So we don't actually know how their funding is moving the needle towards gender equality in Kenya. Thirdly, um, how many gender projects are being funded in Kenya? This might sound like an easy question, um, but it's not necessarily. Um, when you look at one database, again, uh, the picture will look very differently than when a uh, donor reports to another database. Um, so we know that these donors report to both, um, but unfortunately they don't necessarily use the gender marker consistently. Um, and we know that different teams might be responsible for reporting to different databases. So there is a chance of having a disconnect between the reporting, depending on the platform. And finally, uh, one question we have is, you know, more about the qualitative information that you might expect. So who are these projects really targeting? Are they targeting women and girls, um, adolescents? Are they targeting maybe LGBTQ plus people or other people on the gender identity spectrum? Um, what efforts are donors making to make sure that their projects aren't reinforcing gender equalities? Have they conducted gender analyses? And if so, what did they find? Um, and ultimately, what impact are they having? What are the results? Um, how are they really uh, making sure that their projects are learning um, you know, from, from their work and making sure that we can share those lessons with other organizations and ultimately together make sure that the next programs uh, have informed, um, have been informed by those lessons. Uh, we also know that there are some things missing from these data sets. Um, we know that local gender equality stakeholders often have uh, insufficient capacity to collect, manage, and publish data on their gender work um, and report to these global databases. We know that the impact of COVID-19 is still not being reflected enough in the data. Uh, there are time lags with this data, so we need to wait a little bit to make sure that we're identifying the trends and the impact of COVID-19 on gender funding and gender work. We know that there are other actors that fund gender equality, but not necessarily report to these databases. For instance, private foundations, humanitarian actors, INGOs, development finance institutions, and even international women's rights organizations or women's funds, they're less likely to report to these global databases, which means that we know that there's an incomplete picture being shown. So our key considerations to international donors to make gender financing more transparent 
include supporting local gender stakeholders' capacity around gender financing data, which is a point that uh, Sheda also uh, touched upon, to engage with gender stakeholders, making sure that the use uh, increases of these data sources, and then uh, making sure that donor country offices in Kenya also have support. We know that a lot of the headquarters might be in charge of reporting to global databases, but there seems to be a bit of a disconnect where country staff isn't necessarily um, as trained or has the resources to um, publish data or to engage with local gender equality stakeholders around data that's available. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our upcoming event. Uh, next week, we are launching our global report, uh, which touches upon the findings from across Kenya, Nepal, and Guatemala. So it promises to be a really exciting event. It's hosted by Brookings, um, and we have some fantastic panelists, uh, which I'm sure you might have already heard of. Uh, we have Amanda Austin from Equal Measures, Tenzin Dolker from AWID, the Association for Women's Rights in Development, Michelle Sumilas um, from USAID, um, and Marianne Wiersma from the CDC Group, which is the UK government's development finance institution. So a range of actors, uh, all with different perspectives on how gender data matters for gender equality, and also just gender, oh, sorry, just sustainable development goals in general. Uh, and we'll be having a moderator, George Ingram from Brookings Institution as well. The registration link is open and we'll share these slides with the members afterwards if you'd love to uh, register and connect. So with this, I would like to thank you all so much for having me present on our work um, and for listening. And we'd be really happy to, to answer any questions from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, your report is a fascinating reading and I'm sure uh, a lot of us, uh, just like uh, the, the work Open Data Watch are doing, will pick this up and, and run with it. Uh, so expect expect to see your report quoted a lot uh, going forward. Um, I know we are almost out of time, but I had a quick question for the both of you. And I know I mentioned this earlier when I was talking about how um, there's, there's usually an uneven progress on these things within uh, within one country. So on gender financing, for instance, you, 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 you uh, picked out that SD control, for instance, uh, was within this uh, channel uh, that was the predominantly larger beneficiary within the country. Um, now that tends to be a public health issue. Uh, you might also find, I you know, anecdotally, the Ministry of Health um, has had more capacity and more time, um, you know, producing, disseminating, analyzing uh, gender data because of the nature of their work, maternal and child health, non-communicable diseases, and you know, uh, things like, um, like, like STDs. Um, so in, in your view, is, uh, which are the, you know, other than uh, you know, health, which clearly would, would be an outlier, I think, because of the amount of investments that have gone into that over the years. Are there any other sectors that kind of pop up for you um, as, as uh, either being very good at mobilizing financing for gender related work, as well as uh, mobilizing um, uh, financing for gender data to measure progress on where this other money is going. Uh, maybe we can start with you, Shada. Um, very good question, um, uh, Muchiri. I think, I think really uh, it, uh, from what I know, it really changes from uh, country to country or from, you know, from so, sort of different, you know, time period. But, um, uh, but overall, I think what, uh, uh, what I see is that there is not a very clear articulation of the demand side. You know, we monitor a lot of the NSDSs and look for gender data, articulation of gender data gaps and gender data needs. And even th those that articulate it, when they get to the uh, articulation of the action or the budget, you know, they fall short. So, um, you know, so I think there's an overall improvement lift that's needed for, uh, for better planning and better budgeting and making a better case for gender data. That's that's overall what I see from the NSCSs and plans, but you know, but also from kind of uh, 
you know, some sectors, as you said, are, uh, are absolutely better. Sometimes in some countries, agriculture sector make better case for, um, you know, for sort of um, getting into uh, gender data. In some cases, labor force surveys are improving for, you know, adding a module on uh, time use survey to uh, to measure the paid, unpaid, you know, um, workers. So. It also very much depends on the, the sponsors of those surveys, both at the international level, but at the national level as how that gen improving or introducing gender data into these instruments is introduced internationally and, and then sort of built in nationally into uh, international plans. One thing that I really welcome is this new um, plan for, or the new uh, call for integrated national, national data system, which we've seen also in the WDR, the INDS, Integrated National Data System, which brings all the different ministries and all the different organizations together to think together. And if we could benefit from that for gender data, it would be really great. And if we could piloted in a few countries. A lot of countries now are thinking about doing that. So if we, if you can, you know, put your, uh, your power behind that and put some energy into building integrated system, that would be terrific. Finally, I think, Mishiri, I think this uh, clearing house that we are talking about, which tries to balance between the information on the demand side and information on the supply side could help with this unequal nature of um, investment that you're talking about at the country level, because this unequal investment is unfortunately is going to cost the, uh, for the system. It's almost like, you know, your roof is leaking, but you're spending all your money on a new microwave, you know, in the kitchen. You still, you're, you know, so gender data financing is your roof leaking. And the way, the, the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost you. And just fixing other things in the house doesn't fix your roof. So that's my analogy of how can we balance investment for what's really needed. I stop here. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Absolutely true. Jamie? Thank you, Machiri. Um, definitely agree with Sheila there. Um, perhaps I can touch upon you know, the, the unequal investments, as Shada say, uh, they're not just in, in sectors, but also in who receives the gender financing, right? And who is actually able to collect, publish, um, and, and share data. So we know that a lot of women's rights organizations and feminist movements and national and local NGOs, those are the ones that, you know, they have the least capacity to engage with data. Um, and we know that these are very transformative actors in improving gender equality. So there are fantastic initiatives to try and address this. Um, so we have, you know, initiatives like UN Women, as Shada mentioned, we have Equal Measures, who's doing fantastic work to improve gender data capacity. Um, but we also have um, Government of Canada, um, CEDA, which is the Swedish government. Um, and I believe just yesterday, Melinda Gates announced that they are investing 650 million more in women's rights uh, and economic justice, uh, which includes a large focus on data and making sure that feminist movements have access to this and are able to contribute to it as well. So a large part of making sure we have more equal investments also means that we have to kind of flip the power switch as to, to who is really getting the investments. Uh, and we believe that making sure local actors will be a, a very good step towards achieving that. I'll stop here. Thanks. No, thank you, Jamie. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity uh, for partners, you know, funding partners, uh, development partners um, to collaborate more closely with uh, local organizations, build that capacity at the national level um, so that regardless of what happens, there'll always be people on the ground uh, who understand that space, who know that ground, uh, who can advocate and work towards making progress on whatever issues they're, they're facing. Um, I, I know we've talked about parachute development for many years, uh, but, but we, it, 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 it shifts in its form, but still continues to happen. And I see in your report, you picked up a bit of that uh, reality in the sense, you know, that you still have something like 20% of, um, of the money going to a handful of organizations in the countries from which the donor is. It's kind of keeping the money in, in-house um, and you know, not really making as much of a re real presence uh, for that money on the ground in the countries that uh, it's supposed to be supporting. Um, so th that's, 
I, I suppose those, those remain areas of, of, of work, which of course we're very, very happy that Publish What You Find is, is advocating for. You're doing the heavy lifting there. Uh, you know, so we, we appreciate your work. Um, this has been a very, very fast one hour. Um, we had uh, um, maybe a number of people who shared uh, in terms of what they do, where they work. I saw a number of people who work in inclusion, um, around the issues of inclusion, gender data, climate and energy. Um, and it's it's clear, you know, just seeing some of that and the conversations we've had today that the issues of, of um, gender equality are intersec uh, intersectional, intersectoral. Um, you can't just pick one slice and, and, and work with it. As in, a, in isolation, and that's one of the things uh, Lynette and, and the ODN team is currently also looking at, um, trying to see, you know, how, how, what is the data like that is used to make decisions that affect women and girls, uh, you know, especially in, our, in a lot of our context in, in rural Africa, uh, that there are women at the nexus, women and girls are the nexus of energy, climate change, agriculture, nutrition, um, infrastructure, etc. And um, some of these is going to be really important for us. We'll pick this up, we'll run with it, to talk about where more financing needs to be, how to make sure that the data exists and how to put continuous pressure on the public sector to put their the own money where their mouths are. Uh, I was very distressed to see how little money is going into ending violence against girls um, when these are actually very big policy areas for, for the government. So it, we do need to put our own resources behind these things. So thank you very much. I shall stop pontificating now and say I'm looking forward to doing this again. Um, thank you, Shada, uh, Open Data Watch, Jamie, Publish What You Found. Happy to do this again, looking forward. And of course, a very big thank you to the AODN team for putting this together, Lynette, Victor, Amina, uh, our own in-house superstars who uh, make LDI look really, really good. So thank that, uh, I'll say Adios, enjoy whatever is left of your day and see you again real soon. Thank you. Thank you all. See you soon, Michiri. Thanks, Lynette. Thanks, Victor. Bye, Jamie. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you and bye. All right.